stuff just pops out of the other. Where would that come from? Praise the Lord. Thank you for that, Marcus. That was a real blessing. Praise the Lord. And uh, if you would, please, let's take our Bibles and turn over to Genesis, chapter 26. Genesis 26. We'll be reading verses 12 through 25. Now, we read, uh, while you're turning over there, we read uh, the 11th chapter, Hebrews. And uh, I really wanted to just get, give you an idea of the focus there. Those heroes of the faith that are mentioned in Hebrews 11, it's said there that whom the world is not worthy. Whenever I read that, it gives me pause. I stop and I think, what made them so? loved the Lord so much that they were willing to put aside the pleasures of this world in order to see what God had for them. And you know, it's interesting too that they didn't receive the promise yet. They will when Christ returns, but they did it purely on faith. And that's what that, that chapter is all about, faith. So today we're going to talk a little bit about what it is to be a pilgrim. Not the kind that came over and you know, settled in the United States there on boats. No, not that kind of pilgrim at all. The kind of pilgrim we are. Right. We that love the Lord that are saved and called according to his purpose. Pilgrims in this world. So let's look at Genesis uh, chapter 26, verses 12 through 25 as we begin. The Bible says, Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the same year a hundredfold. And the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until... He became very great, for he had possession of flocks and possession of herds, and a great store of servants, and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham, his father, the Philistines had stopped them, and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. And Isaac departed thence, and pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar, and dwelt there. And Isaac digged again the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham, and he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley, and found there a well of springing water. And the herdmen of Gerar did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours called the name of the well Essek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well, and strove for that also. And he called the name of it Sitna. And he removed from thence and digged another well, for that they strove not. And he called the name of it Rehoboth. And he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us. We shall be fruitful in the land. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he builded an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants did the well. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord, for beautiful singing today so sweet, Lord, just to hear these powerful hymns sung with conviction and lifted up to you as a sweet smelling savor. And I pray, Lord, that it would be found acceptable to you. And I pray that our worship today would be acceptable to you, because if it isn't, we're doing this all in vain. But Father, search our hearts. Let us know if there's any wicked way within us and help us to confess that sin right now so that we might have perfect communion with you as we go forward in this message. I thank you, Lord, that you saw fit to make us pilgrims and not to be too content and too comfortable here in this place, knowing that it's just a training ground. It's a time where we learn to be more Christ-like and that our real home is in heaven with you. Come, Jesus, soon, I pray. So, Father, as we look for a little while here at the life of Isaac, the things that happened the valley of Gerar. I just pray you would help us, Lord, to see the parallels in our own lives. I pray, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts. Help us to see, Lord, if there's a need. 
Father, if there's someone here that doesn't know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, I pray that today they would accept him into their hearts, Lord, ask forgiveness, and surely receive it, and receive a home in heaven. And they pass from this earth. So, Father, please take the message. Use it to your will, to your glory. Be sure to give you all the praise today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Amen. Patriarch Isaac was a man who lived in the shadow of somebody. <clears throat> you, ever, you ever see stories like that? You know, some, some great person, and they've got a son who doesn't really seem to follow in the footsteps, and they're always in the shadow. Well, in the beginning of their lives, this, this seemed to be in Abraham's life and Isaac's life, and this seemed to be the case um, that Isaac was just in the shadows. Abraham was doing many things, many great things. And then, he even lived in the shadow of his son Jacob for a while. Abraham was highlighted in some 14 chapters of the book of Genesis. Jacob was a central figure in another 12 books. It's only here, in the 26th chapter of Genesis, that we get a glimpse into the life of Isaac. Hebrews 11.20, you know, we were just reading that, talked about the great heroes of the faith. The faithful. The ones who went and did what they did in their lives based completely on faith. The things unseen. Isaac was far from perfect. He committed some of the same sins that Abraham had committed in his life. That's what I appreciate. I won't say I like. <laughs> but I appreciate that these great heroes of the faith at feet of clay just like us. Mm -hmm. it's, it's where we can actually see a parallel. We can see, wow, I don't feel quite so bad because he did it too. Now, mind you, it's still sin what I did, and I want to get it right, but we're talking about real people. Yes. We're not talking about these models that did no sin. The only one was Jesus. Amen. The only one was Jesus. Now, he committed some of the same sins that Abraham had. And the thing I want to focus on, though, is not the sins. I want to focus on the fact that he was a pilgrim. He was a pilgrim. He was a wanderer, a traveler. A fellow traveler, if you will, with us. As a pilgrim, Isaac pictures the child of God. 1 Peter 2.11 points out that we are strangers and pilgrims in this world. Strangers means a foreigner. One who lives in a place without the right of citizenship. Yeah, I just got back my visas finally for my family. Praise the Lord, huh? That only went on for four months, but we got it. And you know, it reminds me, I'm a visitor here. I'm not a citizen. And it causes me to think a little bit of the situation we're looking at here as believers. We are not citizens, we're visitors, we're guests. Now, the word pilgrim means sojourning in a strange place. Not just wandering, but traveling. You know, living your life in a strange place. Like maybe a desert. During a pilgrimage, Isaac faced many of the same problems and blessings that we do in our journey. So I want to take a few minutes tonight, or this morning rather, and look at this. The pilgrim's life. The pilgrim's life, specifically the life of of Isaac, but what it means to us as well. You know, it's a life, if you're, if you're a child of God, it's a life of great provision. Now look at the first three verses of our text today. It talks about a time of famine. Isaac prospered during that time. When everybody else was having a hard time, when his crops flourished, other people's crops were drying up and blowing away. And undoubtedly, there was a question in their minds. What is going on? What is the magic fertilizer he's using? You know, where did he find water to do this? What is going on here? Why is it with that way with him and not with me? His flocks and his herds grew. Other flocks and herds, right around him, died. They starved. They, they died of thirst. See, Isaac was not a better farmer. He was not a better farmer than the others. He had an advantage, though. He knew the blessings of God, as we do today. We know the blessings of God as we sojourn through this life. We're not doing this just muddling along by accident.
accident, we've got a purpose. We've got somebody leading us. And, you know, God gets the praise. When we go into what looks like an impossible situation, and then he sees and shows us the victory, he leads us to it. If we just go in faith, we know his will and we go there, and then he shows the victory, he gives the victory out of something that the rest of the world might think was thin air, but we know different. We know different. See, the famine came, and when it did, Isaac, I'm sure, was tempted to flee to Egypt, just like Abraham had done before him. However, the Lord had other plans for him, and in obedience, and we talked about this in Sunday school a little bit, in obedience to God, you know, God's not a dictator. He's not a dictator. He loves us so much. But we need to obey him because that's where the blessings lie. So in obedience to the Lord, he stayed where he was, defying logic. He stayed put where the famine was about to happen or was happening in the midst of it. God honored that. God honored his obedience. You know, I think about what I tell my kids now. They're all over 18 now, so I don't tell them much. But when I do, I tell them something, and when they obey, I bless. Amen. There's a principle right there. God Blesses. The kids obey their parents. They bless. Some are different. But the same holds true for us. If we put God first, He'll see to the rest of our lives. Matthew 6.33 says, But seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. There are a whole list of provisions prior to that verse. There were No one said life was going to be easy. Boy, yeah, I see some head. Yeah, life's not easy sometimes. Probably most of the time. There's always something. But the Bible teaches us the opposite, though. You see, if you walk with God, you know that he's in control. Amen. Sometimes your plans get flipped, and you just don't, you don't know where that came from, but you've got to just stop it. Say, okay, Lord, my plan's flipped. What happened? I want you to do something else. Yesterday, I had plans. Let me tell you a little story. Very quick. Yeah. She knows where I'm going already. Yesterday, I had plans to come up here like I do every Saturday. And I was going to work on my messages up here at the church. And then I usually will rehearse them to empty seats. Some of those are the best messages ever, by the way. You know, sneak up here sometimes. But anyway, I'll sit up here and I'll practice. You know, I'm practicing because I want to get the timing right. I want to get, you know, the thoughts really gelled in my mind. And it just helps me. And so I do that. To me, I think that's really important for me. It helps me to kind of settle things. That didn't happen yesterday. The girls were going to go to London. You know, Ashley's visiting. Um, and she's, you know, they're going and doing different sightseeing and stuff. And Juliet wasn't well yesterday. So it was down to Jillian and Ashley. They were going to go to London and see various things. They had a list. They just wanted to go. Ashley just wanted to see things and take photos. Yeah. Not, not go and like, do specific expensive things, praise the Lord. But you know, just wanted to go do those things. And so we, we knew we'd like the art gallery down there in Trafalgar Square. That's free, by the way. You go in there, the National Art Gallery. It's awesome. Free, free commercial for that. But we went there, and we went over to see Big Ben that was covered in scaffolding. And then we went, <laughs> we went to the, the Tower of London. That wasn't covered in scaffolding. That was nice. We got some nice photos. The sun was just on it beautifully. And we basically had a great day. We walked all the way down the mall to Buckingham Palace. Anybody that's done that knows that's a walk. And, you know, just did all this stuff. But the fact of the matter was, they asked me, because Jillian was freaking out. She didn't know where everything was. And she said, Dad, you've been there a million times. You know what this stuff is? So they asked me. So my plans went flip, and I did that. And I didn't get to come up here and do my normal routine. And my wife looked at me and said, yeah, just take a day off. You're going to enjoy it. It'll be a blessing. And I was thinking to myself, oh, boy, I'm going to have to get to church really early on Sunday to get everything to do. You know, and I said, you know what? You put it in God's hands. He, he, I think he orchestrated this. I'll just go. And you know what? We had a great time yesterday. We had a lot of fun. And we walked all over that city. And we rode all kinds of tube trains. And we had a great time. We had some pretty good food. And so, I mean, we got on late last night. There was no studying last night. 
It was just like, but that was okay because, you know, we were totally blessed. So the Lord's plans are sometimes not our own plans. And just because they're different doesn't necessarily mean they're going to be harsh. I mean, that was a great time. It was just different. So nobody said life would be easy, though, but if you walk with God, he's in control. It's that unseen hand of providence. Sometimes we just don't get why the plan changes. But sometimes what looks like the worst disaster you've ever faced, or just a big inconvenience even, can be used of God to bring some of the greatest blessing into your life. You know, 2 Corinthians 4.17 tells us, for, the light, for our light affliction, which is but for a moment, no matter what pain you've got down here, it's just for a little while. It's just for a little while. Because in relation to eternity, it's just a passing second, honestly, which is but for a moment, worketh for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. Exceeding meaning much, much more. And eternal forever. Eternal forever. I don't want to belittle anybody's pain here today. But take this hope. It is our faith. It is our hope. That it's just for a little while. No matter what it might be that you have to endure. Isaac faced problems in the world. It's obvious in what we read here. The Bible tells us that the Philistines were jealous of him. They were jealous of him. He was prospering. They were struggling. Because they were jealous, they wanted to make life hard on him. That ever happened to you? That has happened to me. You know, you're doing a good job and somebody doesn't like that because it makes you look good and consequently they feel they look bad. And so they try and take you out. They try and take you out. I was in the Air Force once. I know. I know. You got those little guys just like I had to lay in there and wait for you. But because they were jealous, they tried to plug up the wells of Isaac that his father, Abraham, had done, that he had dug in the first place. And they even kicked Isaac out of the country. The king said, nope, that's enough of you. You're out of here. Just as it was with Isaac, we shouldn't expect this world to accept us or to understand us. You know, the Lord tells us clearly that those who live for him will receive persecution. We will receive persecution. Some people are jealous when they see the peace that we have and the joy that is evident even going through a trial. They try and plug up our wells with their personal attacks. That's when we need to get serious. We need to rejoice. That's our weapon. It's not vengeance. It's rejoicing in the Lord. Matthew, if you want to turn over there, Matthew 5, uh, 10 through 12. We read that together. That's when we need to rejoice. When the world really comes down upon you. Matthew 5, 10 through 12. Be good to ponder this at home. Just take these verses and roll them through your mind and Meditate on them. Blessed are they which are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs, theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men shall revile you and persecute you and say all manner of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceeding glad, for great, underline that, great is your reward in heaven. For so persecuted they the prophets which were before you. So when, and they will, when the world turns on you, don't be surprised. Don't let them see you upset. Instead, rejoice in the Lord and honor God. Honor God, and he will see you through it. Yeah. He faced problems with the existing wells in, in verses 17 through 22. He faced problems. We already know the Philistines plugged up the wells of Abraham. But they even fought with Isaac over the new wells he was digging in the wilderness. So why the fascination with wells? I think part of it's obvious because of the territory there. There's just not water. There's just not water. 
There's several reasons, though. The primary one was the fact that men and animals must have water to survive. And in that country, it was uh, semi-desert, if you will. Water was just as valuable as oil is to us today. If any man could live in the desert and could provide for his family and for his flocks and open the well, that was as good as having a title or a deed to that property. That said, that person owns it. They dug the well. It was desert. They made it into a prosperous place, and that well was their, their right of ownership. So, to fill in a well was not, actually, not, not just something mean or ready to do. That was an act of war. That was saying, I want you dead. I want you done with. That was an act of war. It was not some light thing. Sometimes we read that and we think, oh, it's just a bunch of mischief taking place. They're filling in the wells. I tell you, I'm here to tell you, they had to dig deep. And they had to shore those things up. A lot of sand in the desert. You had to shore that up with rock. And I'm sure that, that was a huge project in those days. And just to go and fill it back in, that was an act of war. Now, the Philistines hated Isaac so much. They declared war on him. They tried to seize his lands, drive him away from that which really was rightfully his from the days of his father. And notice the fights that he had to undertake. First, he had to go clean out the old wells. Many years before his father Abraham had passed through the land, he dug the wells of water. He dug those wells to meet the needs of his people. Now, the Philistines come along, they plug up the wells, they prevent Isaac from using them. They figure out, oh, that'll be enough. He won't come this way because we'll just get rid of anything that can support him. The Philistines didn't want the wells for themselves. They just didn't want Isaac to have them. He had to take time to stop and to reopen those wells. Then he had to fight for them. He had to contend for the new wells. As he moved along in his pilgrimage, Isaac was always in the business of digging wells. Every time he opened a well, his enemies tried to take it away from him. The water from the old wells was cool and it was refreshing, but more water was needed now. They were growing. Therefore, the new wells were dug. Three of those wells are mentioned here. Essek is the name of one of them. It means contention. That's a pretty obvious word to describe what was going on. The next one was called Sitna. That word means strife or hatred. It has the idea of laying in wait to ensnare somebody. The name Satan also comes from the same root word, by the way. Then comes Rehoboth. Rehoboth, the word means a wide open place. It was at Rehoboth that the Philistines finally left Isaac alone. Everywhere the man went, he faced a fight. The Philistines tried to take away what he had been working for. For Isaac, the pilgrimage was one fight after another. And I guarantee you that your journey through this world will not come without a fight. It's going to happen. But look around you. Look around. Get outside these walls and look around. See who's out there. There's a fight. There's a reason for our fight. The world does not want the gospel of Christ to go forward. The world does not want people to hear the devil. Every time that we go out, we need to remember it's for them we fight. We are servants of the Lord, and He wants more people to know. He wants to build His kingdom, and we're the conduit. We're the people that do it. We're the ones with the hands and feet of the Lord as He works through us. Now, every time we open, reopen a well that the world has closed, you don't think they're going to give up without a fight, do you? If they, if, for instance, if we were not tracking down in the middle of the home, we didn't hand out gospel tracts for years, the world might say, good, we don't have those Baptists to worry about anymore. Then all of a sudden they start back up. I thought we were done with them. And here they are handing out tracts. 
It's funny, you know, I get little emails and messages on the answer phone. You know, don't do this anymore. Well, chances are I won't do your house again for a little while, at least a year. But it's interesting, the pushback. Very interesting. You see, the devil doesn't want that. The world doesn't want yeah. to know. They want to go along in their little way, have fun, accumulate stuff, have experiences, do all the things that the world does. They don't want to be told that there's a God and he has a different plan. So, every time we reopen a well, there's going to be a fight. Every time we dig a new well, for our needs today, every time we defend the wells we have, we're serving the Lord. And we're also serving those that we're trying to reach. Lost. It's a ministry that has to be performed at all costs. If it isn't soon, there will be nothing left to defend. Nothing left to pass down. No inheritance believed for the children that come after us. See, we have to fight for what our fathers believed. We may have to fight for what we believe. But the Lord watches over the whole matter just like he did for Isaac. And he will make a place for us. Now, this life that he gives us is a life of great privilege. It's a life of great privilege. You know, the last uh, three verses of our text, actually last two, verse 24 says, And the Lord appeared unto him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee and will bless thee. And multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there. He called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged a well. See, we have the privilege of hearing from God himself. In verse 24, God, the Lord, actually appeared to Isaac. Now, the Lord appeared and renewed his promises once again, just in case Isaac forgot. He wanted to make absolutely sure that he knew. You know, there's no greater privilege than being able to experience talking to the Lord and being in his presence and hearing from him. And when he speaks, his sheep know him. You get to, <laughs> I'll tell you what's the funniest thing to try to explain to somebody who doesn't know the Lord. Someone who is unsaved, they may say, well, how does God speak to you? And you'll stand there and say, well, it's not an audible voice. Really. But then there's this still small voice. You're like, well, what is it? You know, this still small voice speaks to my heart. Your heart has ears? I mean, it's, it's funny, really. But you know, you know as a believer, you know when God has told you to do something. He puts it upon your heart. How do you define that? Well, a fellow believer knows. But try to put it into words. Sometimes it's pretty difficult. I have a hard time with that. The world does not understand it. But the scriptures are spiritually discerned. We don't, you can't really explain that. Now, we have a privilege, though, of enjoying that communication with God. We have a privilege, privilege of enjoying God's worship. Now, Isaac prepared an altar in verse 25, and he went before God in worship. It's a privilege that's enjoyed by those who know the Lord. What an honor to be able to enter into his presence in worship. Amen. You know, when we think of where we came from, I like that amen. I mean, I, I, you can say that at any time. Amen. It's perfectly biblical. And uh, it's not against the Bibles or anything. Amen. I'm perfectly happy. Hallelujah now and then. <laughs> it's good. That might just get me going. So, praise the Lord. Ever said amen? Thank you. But we enjoy this privilege. You know, we look back and we think about what we were before the Lord saved us. When I look back, there was nothing to say amen about. It was bad, and I'm not going into it, but it was just bad. And I, I think you all can identify. You know, we weren't born saints. But when we think back, we were, and we get to worship God now. We get the privilege of enjoying his word, his love letter to us. We get to look into his
very will for us, his, his desires for us, he puts it in such a beautiful way. You know, before my mom passed, she used to, uh, she was an English teacher. She did grammar as well. And she used to tell me, Jeff, this is some of the best poetry you're ever going to read, some of the purest literature you're ever going to read. And she looked at it from that, and I actually fell in love with the Bible, I think, before I was actually saved. I was saved at 18 years old. And, you know, being a, an English teacher, she loved the old English and the King James, and we would read that, and she would explain to me the, the sentence structure and everything, and then she would say the beauty of the truth that was being revealed in that course of scripture. She was tricky. She got the gospel in by showing me how to do that. But um, we get the privilege enjoying God's word. Isaac was able to pitch his tent in a place that God had marked off for him and then he dwelt there. He lived there. And he was enjoying the blessings of God while journeying through a hostile land. And you know, when you're in the place where God put you, you've got nothing to fear. Nothing to fear. You know God's will and you're in it. And just as Isaac was in the center of God's will by being in the center of the place he had given to him, he was safe in the midst of his enemies. Now, it's becoming increasingly clear that God's true church is not wanted in the world. Just as Isaac was not wanted in the Valley of Gerar, he was not wanted there. But this is not our home. The natives don't like us, but this is not our home. And I praise God for that. You know, the Lord has a way of bringing his best into our lives as we travel along now. You know, while our hearts aren't really beating for heaven, our hearts are where our home is. While they are there, our feet have to walk through a foreign land. Our Father attends our way. He gives us blessings. He makes our pilgrimage a glorious thing. You see, Isaac and his servants dug a final well and they enjoyed the water that flowed from him. After all the work on stopping Abraham's well, and after all the fighting over the new wells, Isaac was given a well of water that was all for him. It was all his. You know, God has a way of giving us exactly what we need. Exactly what we need, just when we need it. You know, as you pass through this world, Look for your well. You know, I know some of you haven't been in the country long here. But I don't think it's an accident you showed up here today. Amen. I think God maybe is saying, while you're on your journey, this might be a good place to stop. It's not a commercial for the church. I'm just saying, that's how God works. Amen. You know, Ariel walked in the door today. What a blessing. He just talked, you know, he's just here to you. Why? But just a blessing talking about things, encouraging each other in the Lord. And I thought, you know, it's no accident. He showed up. I, I, he did much blessing to me as I, I, I hope we're being a blessing to you. Amen. But, you know, it's that kind of thing that lets me know, yeah, we're all sojourners here, but God is going to bless us along the way. Amen. If we're looking for his blessing, if we're looking for his will, I, I, I have a feeling, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I have a feeling that Ariel was probably first and foremost looking for a place to worship. He got here, or even before he got here, he was looking for a place to worship. I, I praise the Lord for that. Amen. I'm glad he chose us. Praise Amen. the Lord. Amen. You know, the Lord said, when he saved you, he placed the well, the well within you, the well of springing water. You know, it's a spiritual well. It's never going to run dry. It's never going to run dry. Even in those hard times. Still, we need to find ourselves drinking from that spiritual well right. that never runs dry. We need to take the time. We need to take the time on our journey to partake of the spiritual refreshment that he has provided for us. And yes, this is a commercial for Bible reading and prayer. That's where it comes from. That's where the refreshing comes from. That's where, oh, man, we were walking yesterday and we said, oh, Jillian said, Dad, you want some water? Slam that water down. I'll tell you what. It was sweet. And I'm telling you what, that's what the Word of God will do for you. You walk through this world and you're all beat up. Man, you get that Bible and you just partake. And 
and that refreshing just fills your soul. And I'm telling you what, there is nothing like it. You know, we need to keep going. We're pilgrims, and we got that established today. We need to keep marching on. We need to keep going. One day, when we take our last, last faltering, staggering step, which I felt like yesterday, but you take that last step here on earth, and all of a sudden it all changes and you take that first step. It's your glory. You're going to know it was all worth it all. You step on the shores of home, and until then, keep looking to God for your provision. He's going to provide. It may not be what you think, but keep trusting. Yeah. Trust Him through all the problems. Keep thanking Him for all the privileges that He has given to us to enjoy as His children. There may be days when the journey is rough, but there will never be a day when the trip is not worthwhile. It will always, always be worthwhile. We are pilgrims, not settlers. This earth is our inn, not our home. I wish I had made that up with J.H. Vincent. What a beautiful thought. So let's not settle down. Rather, let's settle in. But whether our journey be long or short, the Lord's the one that knows. Whatever it is, following him it will be glorious. Just wrote this one little passage from one of our songs in the song. I just thought it was appropriate. Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land. I am weak, but thou art mighty. Hold me with thy powerful hand. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, so much for this message today. I thank you for the attentiveness of the people, and I just pray that this is a blessing to them, an encouragement to know that we can trust you in all situations, that you always have our best interest in mind. And I pray, Father, that we would Go from this place renewed and refreshed, knowing that we need to be in your word all the time. And be praying, knowing, Lord, that you will answer our prayers according to your will. If we just, just but ask. So please help us to do that. And I pray, Lord, but we're about to have this time of invitation. And I pray, if there's someone here that needs you, that has not accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, that they might come and we could show them in the Bible how they might be saved. And Lord, for those of us who are believers, that are following you, that are pilgrims and fellow sojourners in this land, I pray, Lord, that you would help us. Lord, if there's some, something encumbering us in our journey, some sin that might need to be forsaken, I pray, Lord, that we might do that during the invitation. Just ask you for forgiveness, Lord, and never pick that thing up again. And ask you for the help that we need. Whatever the need today, Lord, whether it be salvation, whether it be a change of heart, whether it be just, we want to praise you, God are. I pray, Lord, that you would work during this invitation. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go ahead and stand.